Okay, we're all very well aware of Eventbrite. Uh, we even use it for stuff like this. Um, but, you know, the company has been growing for a really long time and now is facing competition from a kind of new crop of startups. So we're going to look at, at what they're doing here in the future. Please bring up uh, Kevin Hart and Julia Hartz, and our moderator is Mike Butcher. Give him a round of applause. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a good morning. My name's Mike Butcher. I'm the editor at large for TechCrunch. That means I get to be at large everywhere. What does um, it mean to be at large? It means, it means it's a little bit like the Old West, where you're at large, like an outlaw. It's a, anyway, it's a that's British, what I like to think of. British living large. <laughs> living large as well. Now, um, Kevin and Julia Hartz, hearts to hearts, perhaps. Um, it's what our all hands is called, actually, our <laughs> weekly Q&A. You, um, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to be a stagehand and move this slightly. This is kind of awkward. It's a bit, well, there we go. I, I feel can this see you better. Circle. Sorry for that. Um, now, we're all very familiar with Eventbrite, um, it, but uh, obviously it wasn't always like that. Um, you started in 2006, um, and I suppose the, the, the field of events was pretty much wide open, wasn't it? Uh, it really was. We felt um, there was our main competition in 2006, believe it or not, was spread, uh, Excel spreadsheets and email and yeah. people collecting checks or collecting money at the door. There really wasn't anything for um, people like you and I to be able to create paid events. And, uh, you know, for us, the big ticketing industry was really sort of uh, characterized by three main things, bad customer experience, high fees, and lack of innovation or technology. And so it was a, a pretty obvious thing for us to be able to go in and, and try to disrupt the, the industry and the market. You, you came up with the, the idea just as the, uh, the phrase Web 2.0 that we know, all we know and love and has passed into the mist of time now, but it was very much a very new thing, using the web as a platform. Um, but, uh, and in fact, you cut your teeth also uh, with TechCrunch conferences, didn't you? Um, what was the story behind that? Uh, was Arrington rang you up one day? Yeah, so uh, TechCrunch uh, and really all the tech uh, bloggers and um, sort of our, our cohorts were using Eventbrite in the earliest days for tech meetups, and uh, I remember Mike Arrington saying, I think we want to do this conference. What do you think? Can you and Kevin come help out? And I have a picture of us actually um, hand-checking in people on the first, uh, what became Disrupt. So the first conference, we was like the mom and pop shop. We were checking people in at the door. You were actually working the door. Yeah, at before conference. we even had developed scanning technology and all the ways in which you can easily get in the door now, we were doing it manually and manning, manning the front station. So That's... I miss those days. We should have done it today, actually. Uh, we should have. It was a classic early adopter market. Is it, it just worked so well, and specifically in this use case, and specifically at that time in the Bay Area when these companies were, were getting started. And, and, and it took off from there. Um, now, we're all very familiar now with Eventbrite's capability, but um, and I mean, some of the figures associated with it are quite uh, interesting. I mean, 200 million tickets sold uh, so far, $3 billion in gross ticket sales, a $1 billion in sales in the last year alone, is that correct? We actually just hit a $1 billion uh, last week for 2014. And so uh, that's exciting for us because it's a uh, high growth and momentum. Uh, we did just shy of that in all of last year. So it's that's exciting incredible. for us. But we're, we're very familiar with it now. But I mean, the question is, what are you going to do next? So um, is there, a, is there a, a, a pivot is probably far too strong a word. And that used to be a, a bandied around as a phrase. but. Um, how is the ch company going to evolve now? Because obviously in 2006, the iPhone didn't even exist. And now, of course, we have smartphones everywhere. I mean, what are you going to do around events? Because there's such, so much competition for, for uh, engagement now. Mike, we're, uh, we're going to announce today we're rolling out a smart watch. <laughs> You're rolling at out 10 a smart watch? <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Time. You're at the wrong <laughs> conference. We have like the uh, worst time ever. <laughs> No, we, uh, we've thought a lot about how we really uh, 
uh, make our sellers, our organizers on Eventbrite, just absolutely delighted with the service. And that provides this very interesting inventory of things to do. Uh, and what we've noticed is that as we've gotten more and more sellers, more and more organizers onto Eventbrite in San Francisco and New York and London and all across the, the world, uh, is that people are actually coming to Eventbrite to find things to do. Our next great chapter, uh, which we're really commencing now, is how do we attract people to Eventbrite? How do we become a place to find things to do? And it's not a certain category uh, of, of inventory of happenings. It's not specifically just sports. It's not specifically just music. It's not specifically just races. It's all of those things. It covers your entire uh, covers your entire life, whether you're going does, to a professional event or not. What does that actually mean in practice? Does it mean um, is there a, an algorithm approach here, here where you can surface the most interesting events relevant to that user? Right, so we had over a million events last year actively ticketed and attended on Eventbrite. And every week we're selling about a million tickets now. And over half of those tickets being sold are being bought by repeat buyers. So what we want to do is we want to engage those consumers and give them the best possible events that they can attend so that they can discover new live experiences but that they can easily access live experiences that they love to attend. And how we think about it is, you know, we've been very organizer-centric, as, as Kevin stated, so we've been very focused on the seller part of a marketplace. We actually never actively engaged the buyers. We've never said, here are three events we know you'll love, here are two other events that all of your friends are attending, so we suspect that you may want to attend that event. Um, and, and for us, it's about bringing the full breadth of Eventbrite inventory to the consumer because just because you run a mud race or you run uh, or you're a tough mudder doesn't mean you don't like to go to cooking classes or you don't like to attend music events. And so we think of the consumer as this sort of holistic approach to engage them through live experiences and really build this marketplace. Does, that in, does this new focus on, on the user and the, the, the buyer side, does that imply something that you might have made a mistake? that you I might have uh, missed them? I don't think we've made a mistake because it's actually uh, evolved organically. So I think that it's definitely time. I think that it's something to watch. Can, can we actually make this shift? Can we capture this opportunity? It's exciting. Do you, think that, do you feel you're on a, on a pivot point, not a pivot point, but a, a, a moment of change then? Definitely. It's a, it, it's a stair step progression, so you can't get from one to the other. Um, a pivot is you're, you're really moving directions. We're building upon the mass amounts of inventory, and that's why you couldn't do this before. You need the inventory uh, there, and this inventory is very elusive. Events happen, in some cases, like disrupt once a year. They're, they're episodic. They happen uh, on a purely local basis. Uh, there are no international network effects that you would feel like an Airbnb where I can book a, hotel, I can book a place to stay anywhere in the world. You've got to build these networks just in each particular metro, local area, all this is very, very hard to do, and you've got to do this, uh, you've got to get a critical mass of quality inventory of, of interesting a, things happening. Do you, is there a danger that you might leave the uh, sellers behind, that, uh, that, uh, that, that this new focus on the users, or that rather the buyers might... The number one thing sellers lose, ask lose for them. is more buyers. That's what they want. And so, you know, you, you hear, like, company A, B, C, D, or E uh, uh, trying to build some obscure feature, but in reality, Eventbrite sends more uh, buyers to sellers, and, and that is, that's the value. You've created an, an enormous uh, flat platform there for virtually any event that's possible, I suppose, but there are still competitors in the marketplace. Uh, Amiendo still has quite a reasonable hold on many business events in Europe. There's very small startups, but they're interestingly sort of nipping at the heels of the giants such as yourself. It, I, I've went to, uh, listed some like such as attending.io, Tito, very design and tech, Billetto in the UK, uh, y, and now even new, quite well-funded startups like Yplan are, are all about, as you say, event discovery and very much last minute. I mean, is there a danger that you have uh, that there is uh, not perhaps uh, death by a thousand cuts would be putting it too strongly, but definitely uh, niches which are being bitten off by small, reasonably well-funded startups. Well, we, we've just seen throughout history that scale uh, brings, brings that massive advantage. 
you know, it was inspirational watching Peter Thiel yesterday talk about zero to one, and uh, you know, the world doesn't need dozens more thin film uh, solar panel companies. And I, I would say about uh, solar, at least with solar panel companies, there's high barriers and high capital intensity. In the case of our business, there's extremely low barriers to entry, phenomenally high barriers to success, of gaining scale, um, gaining growth, fighting fraudsters, building that momentum, and uh, we're, we're very pleased in the position we are, and we're just going to focus on, uh, on, on our customers, on our buyers and sellers, and, and, and building things out. We are interested, you mentioned some of the buyer side businesses, I think that's very interesting what's happening there, and we're taking a lot of cues from, from that marketplace, and, and uh, a lot to be learned. The, the ticketing industry and the events industry is notoriously old-fashioned, isn't it? Um, uh, some, see, some might even characterize it as a, a little bit of a mafia-style atmosphere in some places. Uh, massive events, massive music events. Um, have you experienced anything like that from the incumbent ticketing industry? Yeah, I think that what we've done really well is focused on the end goal, which is helping organizers sell more tickets. Most of our organizers on Eventbrite of that 1.1 million events that happened last year are, are what we would call the long tail, which is hyper-local, small to medium-sized events that are looking to fill their seats. These aren't the massive uh, concerts that the $1 billion in gross ticket sales last year was not made up of big, huge stadium events. And I think that's what's really interesting about Eventbrite is because it's also this global phenomenon from the long tail perspective, a really big opportunity, and yet we haven't had to break into that you know, top of the market yet to really gain traction and see the, the major growth that we're seeing. And so you know, we know it's there. I think we have aspirations to disrupt all of ticketing and bring live experiences to every consumer around the world. Uh, but you know, we, we know that by building the scale and by building out the marketplace and staying focused on that, we have a way better chance of disrupting the industry than if we were to go head to head with uh, the incumbents. Um, but aren't you going to need those really massive events to, to uh, going forward? At our growth right. rates and, and with the billion you know, that we've just transacted this year, again, primarily in this non-traditional ticketing environment, it just shows the, the massive opportunity there. We're hardly penetrated internationally. Uh, we just the other week had one of our largest selling events in the world happen in Brazil. Uh, so we've got a lot of room to run. And we think about the business more in terms of multi-category e-commerce. Uh, we talk a lot. We admire companies like Amazon, of course, and providing physical goods in many different categories. We do this in, in, in many different categories of live experiences, whether it's a Tough Mudder race, whether it's uh, the Maker's Fair, whether it's a photography class. Uh, these are enormous markets that we're very underpenetrated and we'll spend a lot of time building mass and scale. Uh, in those markets, and as a lesson and as a, a point to entrepreneurs, there are times to take on incumbents, but there's also massive markets around them. Um, Blue Ocean Strategy, kind of the quintessential book describing that is you don't go after these intensely competitive markets. An intensely competitive market is uh, the NBA, is the top uh, Jay-Z, Beyonce concerts, uh, where there's a lot of complexity, I would say, to get into the, that market. So you still feel that there's still plenty of fertile land to be populated uh, in the long tail, I assume. Um, you've got, um, I noticed that uh, there was a new startup called Splash, which is doing, uh, working quite closely with Facebook. Where, where do you want to, where's, what's your relationship with Facebook? Because Facebook events themselves are hugely social. Is there something yeah. uh, to be done there? We've had a great relationship with Facebook ever since the early days of Facebook Connect, and we were actually one of the first users of their events API. So what we saw was organic user behavior, uh, publishing an event on Eventbrite, republishing it on Facebook, linking back to Eventbrite. It was like this horrible experience. And so we got in there really early in 2007 and made that an easier process and integrated very deeply with Facebook. And ever since then, we've, we've stayed close to them, and they're a great partner of ours. I think that, um, I, I think that they you know, value events because they want the news feed to reflect real life. And I think events are as close to real life as you can get from a news perspective in terms of what you're doing or where you're going. 
versus an item you've purchased or a game you've just played. So from that perspective, I think that events are going to be very important to, uh, to Facebook and to everywhere where people share information. And that inventory happens to live on Eventbrite. And so Mike, Mike, you don't necessarily want or need a relationship with Facebook. You, you want and need a relationship with Facebook consumers, with those right. billion people. Uh, and, and that is, the, those are the people, those are the consumers that are sharing Eventbrite events. That is what makes Facebook the number one source of traffic is, to Eventbrite. Isn't there something you could do more that's um, quite relevant around, you know, the live event, people taking photographs and then the archiving that moment? Is something that you would like to get into? Because many, uh, quite a few startups have gone in our, down our that path. Our team is talking a lot about uh, the experience economy. Mm. Uh, I, I was, um, some of our team members were, very cleverly um, kind of discussing this shift, or we've been discussing a lot around this shift away from kind of physical goods, millennials not buying as many cars, uh, less fancy watches, and so on, and more of these experiences. And your newsfeed, if you, you know, think of that as almost a, a fashion instrument, is where the, you can display all these great experiences you're happening and share them with friends. You're, um, you've done a little bit of in angel investing yourselves. Um, what do you look for now that you've been found as you, in your own right? Well, it starts with the team. So it's always about the people and it's specifically about the founders. And I think that um, some of the investments that, that primarily Kevin has made have been in people. And that's exactly how we run our business as well. I think it's a phenomenally difficult market to angel invest right now because there's so much choice. Why that do you there's, think that is? Well, because there's, we just, you know, the United States and Silicon Valley, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful time to be an entrepreneur. We have an unprecedented amount of capital coming in from overseas, from Asia, uh, from around the world. Um, the, the markets are, uh, the, the amount of capital is, is um, you know, beyond what I've seen in any cycle. It's great, uh, it's great to be an entrepreneur, but it's hard to distinguish as an individual uh, investor uh, if I'm gonna invest in, you know, say this uh, photo sharing or calendaring or something startup versus you, you may not know that there are 40 others that exist out there. So when you do invest, if one is to go and invest in this market, um, you know, in the, the teal notion of doing something very contrarian is, is uh, Right. You know, my, my advice. You, 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 in, you invest in people, but you obviously have uh, a, quite a focus on your own relationships. Um, you know, you, you're married, right? And well, you're, you are. You're married <laughs> co-founders. Uh, we are. You, you, you weren't, I gather you weren't married when you started the company. Yeah, right? we were, uh, we had just gotten engaged when we started Eventbrite. So I was living in LA prior and Kevin was here in San Francisco. We actually never really been in the same room at the same time for more than two days because we'd always been uh, together on the weekends and Kevin was working really hard on his second company, Zoom, and I was working really hard in the television industry. So we, we started a company, moved in together, well we got engaged, moved in, to get in together, started a company, got married, and had our first baby in the first 18 months. So that was, I think we did a pretty good job of surviving that. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> you, you, uh, and so but we've just seen today, in the last few weeks also, the controversy around Tinder and the relationships that was inside those co-founders, uh, you effectively avoided all of that by getting married, right? Well, I don't think we avoided it by getting married. I think we made some uh, very thoughtful decisions about how we were going to be able to build a company together. And one of the best pieces of advice we got were from our dear friends, Michael and Sochi Birch, who have founded several companies together, have kids, are married, still love each other. And they said to divide and conquer. So we very much focus on not working on the same thing at the same time. And this is rare that we're uh, doing something together. I mean, the other side of it is that uh, I, in this notion of like this male-dominated valley, when we started, uh, Julia was Kevin's uh, wife. And today, um, I'm Julia's husband. And, and that's a very refreshing evolution in, in the right way. Uh, you, things should, you should feel happen. She's the boss. I, I mean, you know, we don't want to get all gushy, but I think it's really important to have uh, supportive partners. I don't think I could have done, I mean, I'm a first time entrepreneur and I really wasn't planning on being an entrepreneur and I don't think I could be leading and operating the company without the tailwind 
that uh, Kevin provides, and I think it's Im incredibly important to think about with all co-founderships, you don't have to be married to your co-founder to feel that, to find somebody with complementary skills and to have that sort of unconditional support is really, really important. Well, you're, you're, uh, you've obviously um, been through a lot together, and of course now you're, uh, the pressure's on to some extent for the next stage of the company. As you say, you want to surface more, uh, create a more discovery experience for, for uh, buyers. Uh, and of course, uh, on the horizon, perhaps uh, an, an IPO. Um, and uh, you obviously raised a lot more money in the last uh, uh, a few, uh, uh, a few months, uh, for years from Sequoia, Tiger, uh, about $200 million. Uh, so I suppose to some extent the pressure is off to, towards that, uh, that end game. But what's going to happen with the IPO? I mean, what would you do? How would you approach it? Can you talk about that? Well, we raised uh, this money we raised in, in the latest rounds, Tiger, also T. Rowe Price, Henry Ellenbogen. Uh, these, these are public, these are generally public company investment investors. Uh, and, and, and so what you're seeing is just this, this trend of, of companies staying private, taking public style rounds of financing. And it wasn't wide, widely reported, but we did a controlled secondary um, last year. Uh, at the same time, which is, in fact, a, a quasi-IPO. So given the, the amount of bureaucracy, government mess of getting a company public and the crap you have to go through, uh, combined with just opening yourself up to the world and competitors, like, why, why go through it? And, and what we see as a result are companies valued at $17 billion, $10 billion, you know, the, this whole new $10 billion club uh, you know, well, the, the Airbnbs, the Dropboxes, Uber at the 17. You see all these companies that, you know, as, as Amazon went public, I think, at 400 million, uh, you, you see companies going public much more later. And I'd always been in this, you know, coming, being a big fan. I'm, I'm more in the Gates camp than the Jobs camp. Uh, love them both. But uh, it, it just always seemed like, you know, that's your destiny. Go public, build this big independent company. And, and I always assume we'd be public by this stage of the company, but now we want to wait. And, and it's for those aforementioned, uh, you know, big issues. You, you, you don't have confidence in the way things are structured right now? Well, I don't, I, I'm just not thrilled with the amount of bureaucracy that, uh, and scrutiny that a company has to go through, and also um, with the amount of capital out there, you in a sense create more competition and more awareness of your business. And operating in, uh, in I won't call it secrecy, but operating without the um, you know, microscope of the industry under there. At the same time, we are out there talking to the usual suspect public company investors, which all late stage companies should be doing, uh, and, and getting to, them, to know them for that day that we are public. Well, it's uh, a long way since, a uh, long time since 2006, and uh, handing out uh, tickets at TechCrunch events. Um, how do you feel from now? It's, it's pretty incredible to watch the growth of the company. It feels like no time at all. I can't believe it's, it's been eight years. But I think that for us, we're always looking forward. You know, we have uh, 400 Breitlings around the world in seven different offices. And we're always looking at what's next and how can we grow this amazing opportunity that we know is a global opportunity. And I, hopefully we'll be back next year to, to give you guys progress on, uh, on our plans and our growth. We look forward to seeing you next year. Kevin and yeah. Julia Hartz, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you.